my great pleasure to be here today and many thanks to the Rector Magnificus Automol for inviting me. Um, it's really a very impressive celebration. For me, it's the first time I'm experiencing it and, it, and it's delightful. Um, <laughs> I searched the web for uh, uh, what I thought might be exciting pictures of microbiologists at hard at work. And these were some of the most exciting pictures <laughs> that I could find. And um, at least when I started my studies, what I couldn't understand was why anyone would want to be a microbiologist. Mainly, you're looking through a microscope. These are tiny organisms. You can't see them. People get super excited about the, how they grow, uh, which means simply that they divide, and whether they're in a lag phase or an exponential phase or a stationary phase. And that seemed to me like pretty much all that microbes had to offer. And so what I wanted to be was a marine biologist, right? This was, uh, I had this vision that I was going to be diving along coral reefs and that the water would be at least 25 degrees warm and that I would spend my mornings in the field diving, then go back into the lab and do a little bit of lab work. And, and I didn't even understand the whole process of, of writing papers or anything like that or during reviews. Uh, so for my master's thesis, uh, the reality looked a little bit different. Uh, it was uh, in the Wadden Sea and it was in very, very muddy sediments that I was working. You would sink in very deep. It would creep into uh, practically everywhere. And uh, I was working on benthic animals and trying to understand uh, how they tolerate low oxygen and high sulfite concentrations. And what I realized was this really has to change. Uh, if I'm going to stay in science, I need to figure out a different research topic. And my PhD advisor, Olaf Gira, at the University of Hamburg, suggested that I could work on little worms. These are worms that are so small that you can barely see them with your naked eye. They're only two centimeters long and half a millimeter wide. And I remember when I, as a student, had first uh, heard Professor Gira give talks, and I always thought, how sad is that to dedicate your entire research life to worms, which is what I work on now. Um, uh, so uh, that, that I wasn't really convinced that these would be this would be exciting research. Then he explained where they you could collect these worms, <laughs> um, and uh, and and their main distribution area is in tropical and subtropical coral reefs and seagrass sediments. And, and then I thought, well, I could do that. Uh, first trip went to Bermuda, but. Obviously, um, there's something else that's interesting about these worms and that I will uh, uh, try to explain during my talk. They don't have a mouth, they don't have a gut, they don't have an anus, and yet they are able to live. And that's because they live in symbiosis with microorganisms that provide them with nutrition. Um, and these are symbioses, and i just like to uh, emphasize that it's only in the last decades that we have begun to understand how important symbiosis is for the evolution of life. And uh, uh, beginning with Darwin and for, for many uh, decades afterwards, the focus was very strongly on competition and predation. But we now know, thanks to microbiome research and thanks to understanding that uh, many microbes have beneficial roles uh, in their associations with plants and with animals, uh, that uh, uh, mutualistic interactions form the basis of many species-rich ecosystems. Symbioses on land have been well studied for centuries because they're much easier to reach than those in the oceans, but that's where we have the highest biodiversity of uh, organisms, and 70% of our oceans, of our planet's surface, are oceans. The ones that have been studied well are corals, but we're still struggling to understand, for example, bleaching effects and exactly what the communication, how the communication between the symbiotic algae and the host breaks down. 
the energy source for these symbioses is sunlight, photosynthesis. They have primary producers in the form of algae that live inside their body. They use sunlight as an energy to fix CO2 into organic carbon and feed the coral host. So it's photosynthetic or photosymbioses. The gutless marine worms that I began working on, however, although they occur in shallow waters, they live in the sediment. There's not enough light there for them to harbor photosynthetic microorganisms. So they must be gaining their nutrition differently. And now I'm going to take you to the bottom of the deep sea, which was uh, and a discovery, the discovery of hydrothermal vents in 1977, because until that time, although researchers knew that these gutless worms occurred in shallow water sediments, and they realized they didn't have a mouth or a gut, they didn't understand how they were gaining their nutrition. That changed in 1977. Uh, what you see here is the first manned submersible, or first submersible period that was used by research to go to the bottom of the ocean. Before then, it was not possible to reach the deep sea. Uh, the submersibles were developed by the uh, Navy, and uh, the US Navy uh, gave uh, Alvin here, which many of you might have already seen in videos, uh, to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Geologists were looking for hot springs in the deep sea, and the reason they were looking for them was because uh, there was evidence that hot springs, as we know them from Iceland, where it's just recently erupted, that uh, there were hot springs also in the deep sea in the ocean where the tectonic plates are moving apart. These are huge spreading ridges in the deep sea. Uh, magma rises up from the Earth's mantle, and it forms new ocean crusts. We estimate about at the speed that your fingernails are growing, so that you can get an idea of, of the speed with which uh, they spread apart. And in, in magmatically uh, strong areas, hot vents, hydrothermal vents develop. And so geologists went down with Alvin, 3,000 meters deep off Galapagos Islands, and they were looking for these hot springs in the deep sea. What they knew was that most of the deep sea is a desert. And these are super exciting images of the deep sea because you see something. Most of it is just mud. Um, and what you see here is a sea, sea cucumber or a, 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 a sea star, uh, but otherwise you see nothing or very little. And the reason for that is because there's very little food in the deep sea. And that's because life on Earth, animal communities, are dependent on primary production. Uh, and what you see here are trophic food webs, and at the basis always lies primary producers. And it was assumed until the discovery of these hydrothermal vents that you couldn't have large animal communities without sunlight that this was the form of primary production that fueled all large animal communities. And uh, from the surface of the oceans, there's very little of the primary production from algae that actually makes it to the deep sea because it's all being eaten up uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the zooplankton that is in the water column or it is decaying. So now you have to imagine there are two geologists with the pilot, and they're sitting in the Alvin. They've gotten down to 3,000 meters water depth. And they start to see lava, which, which they had expected, uh, that they thought would be down there at the bottom of the sea. Um, and they started to see shimmering water as an indicator that they were getting near hot springs. But what was completely amazing and thrilling to them was to discover these gigantic animal communities at 3,000 meters water depth. What you see down here are gigantic tube worms. They're as big as my arm and as thick as my arm. Uh, they weren't quite sure at the time what kind of animal it was. It's reported that the geologist uh, called up to the mothership and said uh, to the only student on board that was studying biology, uh, isn't the deep sea supposed to be a desert? And she said, yeah. And they said, because there are a lot of animals down here. 
So their question was, of course, what is the source of primary production that is fueling these large animal communities? How can we understand uh, what is supporting uh, these ecosystems? And so it became very clear when the first samples came up from the submersible, they reeked of hydrogen sulfide. And that's that smell of rotten eggs if you've ever gone out uh, in the Wadden Sea and dug a little bit deeper and it starts to smell all rotten. That's hydrogen <coughs> sulfide, but also methane and hydrogen. And if you take those reduced compounds and you bring them together with oxidized compounds like oxygen, of which there's plenty in the deep ocean, then you get energy. If you've ever had hydrogen and oxygen come together, you know that you can have a Knigas uh, reaction where a lot of energy is released. Microbes have harnessed that energy and can use it in a process called chemosynthesis um, to actually then fix CO2. So this is what's driving these communities at hydrothermal vents. So in, in contrast to primary productivity from photosynthesis, in chemosynthesis, what you have is the chemical energy from the oxidation of reduced compounds. Symbiotic bacteria can use that to make ATP to gain energy, fix CO2 into organic compounds, and then uh, the reward is they get eaten by the host. So it, these are farming symbioses where the host then lives from the chemosynthetic energy production of their animal host. The discovery of these deep sea hydrothermal vents completely revolutionized our understanding of the energy sources that fuel life on Earth. Microbiologists had known about chemosynthesis long before, uh, over 100 years earlier, but that they fuel this kind, these kinds of ecosystems, this is what was new. And we now know that chemosynthesis can form the basis for large animal communities. And the biomass is, is very high, as high as that of tropical rainforests. We like to call them the oases in the deep sea or the rainforests of the deep sea. And they're based entirely on microbial symbioses. This fuels, these symbiotic microbiomes fuels these communities. In my lab, we work on deep sea mussels, not the large tube worms that I showed you. And they form these incredibly large, massive mussel beds in the deep sea. And the biomass, the, the number of, of, of mussels or carbon that they produce per square meter is two to five times higher than their shallow water relatives. And that's because they don't have to do the hard work that shallow water blue mussels have to do to filter and get all that plankton into them. They can just hang out there and have their symbiotic microorganisms in them and have a little bit of oxidized seawater coming in, a little bit of reduced water from the vents, and harness that energy. I'm going to show you a video of a research cruise that we did to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge with uh, the research vessel Meteor. We're zooming out from the Max Planck Institute campus where I'm a director. We had a research cruise to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. You'll see the four vent sites that we visited. They all have Russian names. That's because uh, if you discover a vent site, you get to name it. And these were all discovered by Russian scientists. The French uh, have a lot of names like Lucky Strike and Guinness for some of their vent sites. And I named one called Clueless because we had no idea where we were when we were diving down at the bottom of the ocean. We work with remotely operated vehicles. So these are unmanned submersibles that uh, are on a tether from the ship through an umbilical cord, which provides the energy, but also through uh, fiber optics, allows us in real time to see where the submersible is on the sea floor and to work with the arms that are on the robot so that we can collect samples, but also take images like these. As you get closer to hydrothermal vents, you start to see the shimmering water from the very hot water up to 413 degrees has been measured as it comes out of the black smokers. And as you move closer to the hydrothermal vents, you start to see these incredibly huge muscle beds uh, that you can see here. And there are many other animals that can then thrive off of them. Here are sea stars uh, or annelids that, that, that colonize the surface of them. 
The black smokers are particularly uh, fascinating and beautiful and often shown in deep sea um, films where this is a beehive-like structure uh, where I had the great fortune of measuring some of the hottest temperatures on Earth, 413 degrees to our knowledge is the highest. And we have special designed uh, instruments that are gas tight and temperature that can stand these high temperatures so that we can collect the fluids and then analyze which of the energy sources are available at these vent sites. Um, what you're going to see here are a very impressive deep sea shrimp. They're called Rimicaris. They've lost their eyes, but they have gained a third eye on the back of their head that allows them to detect temperature. The crabs, as you see, uh, love to eat them. Uh, that's important because they want to avoid the super hot waters. Uh, every once in a while, we see cooked shrimp at the bottom of a smoker because something went wrong with their ability to detect it. What you see here is the mussels look very similar to their shallow water uh, relatives. Here we're in the control van, and we're telling the pilots what to do in the deep sea. And what you can see here is that they're working with a small little arm manipulator to work the arm, the claw of the ROV. And what we're doing here, this is still one of my favorite experiments, we're still analyzing the data, is that we're taking the mussels and we're fixing them at the bottom of the sea in 3,000 meters in RNA later. It's a fixative that you use to look at uh, the genome and transcriptome of the organisms because uh, we're seeing that bringing them up through 3,000 meters is not a great way to look at what they're doing in the deep sea. What you see here is we've transplanted the mussels away from the energy sources because we're interested what happens to the symbiosis there. Is there a breakdown of it similar to corals? How does that breakdown happen? And what you can see here is that there's not a lot of room on the ROV for all our instruments, so we designed an elevator where we uh, also bring down extra equipment that we have. Uh, cost 20,000 euros and we lost it on the first cruise <laughs> in the deep sea, spent a whole day trying to look for it again, but never found it. Um, so it's also expensive research. Um, <laughs> Um, what you can see here is we spend 12 hours during the day. The ROV goes into the water usually at 8 in the morning. It comes up at 8 at night. Um, and we've already been working in the van for the whole day with the pilots uh, on, 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 on the sampling itself. But now comes for us the hard part in the lab because we need to fix them for all sorts of methods, for imaging methods, for omic methods, for experiments. Uh, we're, as you can see here, super eager. We, we race to get our muscles as quickly as we can because those that we didn't fix in the deep sea and that are alive, uh, we want to get into cold water. When we work in warm waters, it's 25 degrees at the surface, and they're not happy there because down at the deep sea, uh, the hottest they go is 18 degrees. And what you'll see now is going to be a microcomputer tomography image. As we're zooming into a muscle now, we just opened it, and you're going to see a tomography, a micro CT, or like a CAT scan like you would do in the hospital, where we're dissecting through the muscle and looking into the muscle. And what you will see as we go through the shells are big, fleshy gills of the animals. This is the organ uh, that it's now being revealed, these brown tissues that are layered and lying there. And they are usually so small in your shallow water muscles that you won't see them. And here they're greatly enlarged, and that's because that's the organ that is harboring the symbiotic bacteria. That's made out of thousands and thousands of uh, slats, like vertical slats in a curtain, that are called filaments. And these are greatly enlarged. Uh, and what you're going to now see is imaging methods like fluorescent and cytohybridization, where we can visualize the symbiotic bacteria inside the cells. And here there are two types that are, uh, you could see types that use sulfur as an energy source and one that use methane. I did a calculation here of how many inhabitants you have in the city of Wageningen and how many are in an eight centimeter large muscle. And what you can see is that the muscle of only eight centimeters packs in a lot more symbiotic inhabitants um, than here in Wageningen. And that's because it has increased the organ in which it carries it over 40 fold to be able to house them. 
Um, I promised I would stick to 25 minutes, and so I want to make sure that... Um, Oh, great. So I can also show you what it's like um, to sample a shallow water habitat. Um, OK, so we discovered these chemosynthetic symbioses in the deep sea at hydrothermal vents. Very shortly afterwards, they were discovered at cold seeps, hydrocarbon seeps. Uh, in fact, the oil industry had often known that there were animals there. Uh, uh, and, and, and these are sites where we can also find chemosynthetic symbioses. Particularly fascinating are whale falls. When uh, whales sink to the bottom of the ocean, their meat disappears very quickly within only a few months. But their bones are full of oil. And sulfate-reducing bacteria then start using this oil and processing it, and hydrogen sulfide develops. And these little pink, uh, um, well, actually, I should be showing this way. Uh, these little pink uh, uh, spots that you see here are uh, little annelids that are actually closely related to the large tube worms in the deep sea, and they have bone-degrading symbionts, so not sulfide-degrading, but can actually degrade the bones of these whale falls. But what is remarkable to this day is that we had to go to the bottom of the ocean to realize that these types of chemosynthetic symbioses are in our backyard, that they're in shallow water sediments. Again, zoologists knew of animals in shallow water sediments that didn't have a mouth and a gut, but they didn't understand how they were gaining their nutrition. And so we now know in the shallow water gutless marine worms, going back to the ones that I first began studying in my uh, postdoc, that although they live in uh, environments that are driven by photosynthesis, like uh, coral reefs and like seagrass meadows, that the animals themselves, because they live in the sediment, have sulfide oxidizing bacteria that are providing them with nutrition. And just to give you a little impression of what it's like when we collect them, working in the deep sea is expensive, going out with these vessels, 50,000 euros a day is what we estimate, uh, and uh, a workhorse ROV is about 2 million, and then you need the crew of about uh, six pilots uh, to that, that you need to hire year-round that actually fly them. When we go out and collect our shallow water um, worms, this is the sophisticated equipment we need. We need a bucket uh, and a sieve. And I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, this is, by the way, Olaf Gura, my PhD advisor, and Chris Arzeos, a taxonomist who can actually tell these worms apart morphologically, which is really an art in itself. Caribou Key is a research station of the Smithsonian on the Belize Great Barrier Reef. And you can, uh, it's, 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 it's wonderful to be able to go out there as a research scientist. And we go out straight from the island. It's a teeny tiny island. We go out with a bucket. And uh, in knee deep water, we collect the sediment. Um, usually we go down about 10 or 20 centimeters with our hands, scoop it into a bucket. Then we take the bucket back to the lab. Um, you'll see it's a very uh, simple and rustic uh, lab that we work in, but we love it. Um, it's a real luxury to spend two weeks there. You just um, you do something called decantation, which is just a method uh, in which the worms then are lighter than the sand. The sand falls down quickly. And this is what you then see in a microscope. And everything that is white is a chemosynthetic host. And that's because they have lots of sulfur inside of them. And that's why they're white in what you're seeing here. So they're very easy for us to collect. All right. So why uh, would anybody care about uh, gutless marine worms and deep sea mussels? Uh, and we'll be hearing three more talks that will make it very clear that uh, beneficial microorganisms, symbiotic microorganisms, are ubiquitous. And I'll finish up uh, with emphasizing the importance of microbial symbioses, that it was not competition alone and predation alone that drove the incredible, remarkable diversity of life on our planet. Uh, all, almost all plants and almost all uh, animals, and certainly humans, live in close intimacy with millions and millions of beneficial microorganisms. And cooperation and symbiosis have played a key role in the evolution of life uh, and our planet's biodiversity. And with that, um, these are the funding sources that allowed me to do this research and my group. And I thank you for your attention. And again, thank you for inviting me.